before I get to it, I uh, just want, wanted to introduce us and tell you a little bit more, a little bit more about who, uh, who we are. So some of you already know me because I've been on the Jupyter team for a few years working mostly on widgets and uh, front-end matters. Uh, but this is not the matter today. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to, we're going to present something really different and really new. Um, so up until a few months ago, I was a quant researcher at Bloomberg, uh, where I wa worked on the same team as uh, Jason Grout, who is another core dev, and Paul uh, Ivanov, uh, and um, up, uh, like, then I relocated to France and founded QuantStack, so which is a, a was first a one-person company and now is a two-person co two-people company building scientific software and uh, tools around Jupyter. Um, so you, so my handle on Twitter and GitHub is Sylvain Corlet, so you know where to find me. Uh, come and follow us. We, we tweet a lot about scientific computing and the new, new software in this ecosystem. And Johan is uh, someone I've worked for a long time with for over the past years. He, before joining QuantStack, he was a scientific software developer at HSBC and joined QuantStack that, uh, last year. And he's the uh, co-author of Extensor, Exus, XSIMD, and a few of the, of the other libraries that we're going to talk about today. Um, so one of, I, mean, I think the main strength of the Jupyter ecosystem is how modular it is. And one of the greatest point of extension for the Jupyter architecture is the Jupyter protocol, is a kernel protocol. Uh, so as you may know, actually, uh, Jupyter used to be called uh, IPython in that it was mostly an interactive development environment for the Python programming language, but a lot of the infrastructure and of the of the tools were actually language agnostic, and it was later renamed Jupyter. Uh, and the parts that are don't, don't really, are not really Python specific were renamed to Jupyter. And now we have more than uh, 40 uh, kernels that exist. By kernel, I mean the part of the infrastructure that is responsible for executing the code. So we have kernels for Python, Sage, Julia, Scala, R, Ruby, and many, many more. And all of these languages can now make use of the various Jupyter frontends, such as the Notebook, the Qt console, Jupyter Lab, Spider, Interact, and, and many others. And the reason for that is that the protocol was really well defined and documented, and it's a reasonable endeavor to start and implement the protocol for a new language. Uh, so th there has been um, uh, two approaches for implementing new kernels. Uh, the first one is to actually have a, an implementation of the protocol in the target language. So for example, Python has its own kernel written in Python, which is IPy kernel. Uh, R has a kernel written in R, uh, and the same holds for Julia. Although many other have make use of the wrapper kernel approach, which uh, which is to actually have a, a Python uh, program that implements the protocol, call uh, to the interpreter that you want to wrap, and you will just be um, uh, capturing the output of that interpreter and sending the messages from the Python process. So some, there, there has been some uh, significant uh, work uh, that make use of the wrapper kernel approach, for example, the current Octave and MATLAB kernels actually use that uh, system. Uh, although there are some, um, some issues with that approach, uh, first, we, there is an obvious dependency on the Python runtime. Uh, uh, there is no reason why you should need Python uh, to make a MATLAB kernel, after all, or for, to make a, a kernel for an, some other language. Um, in fact, the kernel is merely an executable that implements an inter-process communication protocol, and it should not really need a Python runtime. Also, the wrapped interpreter may not have a very usable Python API. And finally, if you want to do richer things with that kernel, such as have, have using Jupyter Interactive widgets, uh, etc., then uh, it, it may be very difficult with the wrapper kernel approach to expose these parts of the, of the Jupyter protocol. Uh, so, and that's why today I want to uh, introduce and announce the release of Xeus, which is a modern C++ implementation of the Jupyter protocol that enables kernel authors 
to create new kernels much, uh, with much, e much more ease without having to deal with the actual uh, Jupyter um, protocol idiosyncrasies. So for example, if you want to implement a very uh, a simple eco kernel, all you need to do is generate from our base X interpreter virtual class and imp implement a few, a few methods that take very basic and simple types such as ints, uh, strings, and booleans. So you, you don't need to know much about the Python to know what these methods have to do. And in their implementation, you can call into the C API of the interpreter that you're trying to wrap. So for example, when you want to make a kernel for SQLite or some other DSL, you just inherit from that class and call onto the C API and then you, you, you just use that interpreter as a library in process, which is very different from the wrapper kernel approach where you would spawn a new process and try to capture the textual output from, from it. Uh, so what can you do with this? So uh, we kind of just announce a library that makes it easier to create kernels without showing a kernel that didn't exist before using that library, right? And so we decided to show off a little bit by creating a kernel for the C++ programming language uh, based on Kling. And Kling is, it's not Kling, it's actually C-L-I-N-G, it's not a typo, it's, it's a C++ interpreter that was developed at CERN as part of the root uh, data analysis framework. Um, and the two main authors of that, of that interpreter are Axel Noman and Vasil Vasilev. Uh, and if you know what C++ in, uh, compilers do, you realize how much a total force writing a C++ interpreter must be. So this is uh, literally incredible and it actually is functional. Uh, so now I'm going to leave it to Johan for a live demo of the, of the C++ interpreter. But uh, real quick, I realized that I need to start the server, so I'm going to do this right now. I'm typing Jupyter Notebook, All right? There you go. You're on. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I will start with really simple stuff, such as um, outputting something. So let's see. Uh, output stream and hero stream. So what happens here is um, this block of code is sent to Kling, which compiles it actually. It's not really um, interpreted, it's compiled. You get some runnable code and then it's executed and the output is sent back to the notebook. Uh, the same happens for the here for the hero stream. Uh, you can uh, just ask for the value of a variable. You can do that uh, in two ways. Uh, when you assign variables, you omit the semicolon at the end or you can assign variable and ask after that for uh, its value. Um, as Simon told it, said it, um, Kling supports um, most of the features of C++ and of modern C++, so you can define functions, classes, templates. I will start with a simple function, so just compute the square of number here. So you have the output that you expect. Um, now about classes, you can define class with a function that just prints the name of the class and the uh, value of a number. Use it. It's also support polymorphism. So we can, uh, suppose I want to redefine uh, the behavior of the print function here. I can define a bar class that generates from foo. And uh, just uh, the only change just print another name before the value. Oh, and also twice value, sorry. So get, uh, again, we get what we expect. Uh, we also support templates and template specialization. So like, uh, let's define some uh, footy class, which prints uh, the type of number and its value. Uh, and a specialization for integer, just print value. Now if I use it, here I see so the type is D, not really useful, but uh, it exists. And for int, we don't have the type. We also have a uh, support for um, Modern C++ features such as a move semantic. As you can see here, so we define a copy constructor, move constructor, and uh, everything is called as it should be. We have support for um, ESTL classes such as vector, but also a list, map, and a lot of things that uh, I will not show here. For the auto uh, keyword, which was introduced in C++ 11. Also lambda, universal references, etc., etc. So another thing that is cool is that we have um, access to documentation. So here, if I want to know what is available uh, in vector, 
sorry. So I can, uh, here I'm on CPP reference, and I can, uh, yeah, just scroll and go to uh, definition of, uh, let's say, uh, back function. Okay, so get everything that we need. And the last thing, which is really cool for a plus plus kernel, is um, we have access to auto-completion. So just the class that we defined before. Okay. So now that we have um, now that now that we have a C++ kernel running, uh, we may want to do something with it, such as scientific computing. The problem is that um, one of wonderful tools that's missing in the C++ ecosystem is NumPy. Fortunately, we got a solution for that called Extensor. So Extensor is uh, actually a C++ template library meant for multidimensional uh, array manipulation. It follows the idiom of the STL, so we got iterator pairs, clear value semantics, and also it has an API similar to that of NumPy. It's merged at a C++ project, so we provide bindings to Python, Julia, R. We also provide cookie cutter projects for authoring of Python, Julia, and R extensions. We provide blast bindings, and also SIMD acceleration. And all of these projects are, of course, open source and BSD license. So about uh, the API of Extensor. So as I said, it's really similar to the one of NumPy. So as you can see here, we can uh, yeah, define uh, multidimensional arrays, reshape them. We get link space, look space, and a lot of building functions. We provide view, broadcasting, universal function, filtering, reducers, logical operators, mathematical functions, random module, also stack and concatenate function, and much more, so missing values, fancy indexing. So uh, I will uh, let Sylvain take over for a live demo. Yeah. Open mic. Uh, yeah. So the idea of extensor, I, I hope that you appreciate that we're giving a, can you hear me? Yeah. I hope that you're, we're giving a live coding demo of a C++ library. And it's not really common. Uh, <laughs> so uh, not, not that C++ is hard. It's that most of the time C++ is not really, you know, interpreted. So uh, let's, so also, another thing that I wanted to say, even though it really looks like Python, it's not Python. This is uh, not Py uh, NumPy code. It, uh, it's, it is an uh, extensor uh, running here. Uh, so if you just define an X array that is the extensor counterpart to a NumPy array uh, with an initial as a list, uh, you get what, what you expect. And you can take a view on one of the, of the rows and print it, or make the sum of the view with another array and get the, re the, the result that you, you would expect, right? Uh, you can take, uh, define a 1D array, we, we shape it in place, or use a thing such as the broadcast function that, is, that has exactly the same API as the one of NumPy and get an experience again that is very, sim very close to what you would get in a Python notebook with a, using NumPy. Uh, most of the NumPy API is uh, covered. So for example, you can use the random module uh, and, and initialize a a, a new random matrix of size 4.3 and, and obtain the expected result. Use builders such as linspace, ones, uh, broadcast, um, or even uh, use some of the idioms of the C++ standard library upon NumPy arrays, uh, calling into STD accumulate to iterate uh, upon all the values of an array. So you have both a NumPy-like high-level API that allows you to do most of what you do usually with NumPy, and uh, a C++-like API with iterator pairs allowing you to iterate upon the end array in many, in many fashions, like in a row major fashion, with a colon major fashion, we have multiple iterator pairs for all of these. Uh, or even doing some broadcasting iteration. Um, then, 
Um, we, as, as, as we said earlier, we have multiple uh, bindings uh, that come with Extensor. Uh, extensive LAS is a, is a set of bindings to the BLAST libraries. And when I do uh, hash include uh, extensive LAS slash xlineage.hpp, I am loading the equivalent to the NumPy lineage module. Uh, another thing that's happening here is that uh, when I do this, actually, there are some special instruction, instructions in that header to ask Kling to load the, re the required a blast runtime that we need to, to use to actually perform the operations. So now if I define a 2D tensor and compute the matrix rank, the inverse, or the eigenvalues, I am effectively making calls to the underlying blast runtime. Um, so yeah, very much an experience uh, that you would expect from a Python runtime, but in a executed C++. Um, so now I'm going to move on to the next item, which is Jupyter Interactive Widgets. So this is an area where Jupyter uh, shines uh, particularly, is that uh, it's very easy in the Jupyter Notebook to create a simple UIs and GUIs uh, for, uh, in Python without having to know any JavaScript that would be run and displayed into the Jupyter Notebook and that you can deploy uh, as in, uh, standalone applications in uh, web pages. So this one example here, for example, is a, a screencast of uh, a, a small application that is built with the BQ plot, uh, plotting library built up on API widgets, another project that we rewrote uh, on the top of the Jupyter Interactive Widgets uh, library and which displays the uh, election results for, from 2016. And as you hover on uh, each county, you would see the result, uh, the, the percentage of the people that voted for the Democrats in that county. So th this is uh, the sort of things that you can do very easily with, uh, with the Python kernel, and that would be really difficult to do in C++, right? Um, although one of the... Um, one of the reasons why it's, it's actually a, a doable thing uh, to create a backend for another kernel is that the Jupyter widgets library is, uh, actually has a very thin backend and a thick frontend. Most of the logic lies in the frontend and is in JavaScript. There is very little done in the backend besides some synchronization, some declaration of attributes that need to, needs to be synchronized with the frontend. So basically, all that exists in the, on the Python side is, uh, of the widget is a, Python, is a model object that has a few attributes to be synchronized with the frontend. So for example, the, the inslider widget, uh, th this is the complete implementation of the inslider widget here that takes like 12 lines to uh, declare a few attributes such as a step, orientation, readout, uh, continuous update, disable, style, and min max values uh, defined in the base class. Uh, so doing something similar for the C++ should be actually doable as soon as we can implement the protocol for the widgets and the observer pattern that let us send notifications to the front end uh, for, um, in C++. So we have written the foundations for C++ backend for Jupyter Interactive widgets. So first, an implementation of the observer pattern that mimics the behavior of threadlets, and we called it X property. Uh, and then an implementation of the core widgets library, uh, which would be IPy widgets in the Python world, and that we called X widgets in the case of C++. And I'm going to leave it to you, Anne, for a live demo of X widgets. Okay, so let's start with a simple example such as a slider. So just um, include the header, clear it, display. It takes some time because um, X property is made of a lot of uh, meta programming stuff, so it's quite uh, complicated from the compiler. So, okay, so now I have here a slider in C++. Ah. Oh, it moves. It's okay. Um, can reset its value if I want, or I can ask for its values. So here we get two syntax. One is triggering the observer and the validation, uh, which should be this one. 
we ask, uh, the other just ask, so we don't want to have validation or observer or whatever. So we can also um, reset the maximum value of the slider. So you see just how it changed, it's updated. We can do a lot of uh, things that we can do with this IPI widget, hopefully, such as uh, changing color, okay, or making a vertical slider. Okay, still working, didn't break anything. Uh, there's quite a um, difference with, uh, well, we go to that after. Another widget that we can uh, implement is, uh, we have implemented, sorry, is a button. And we can also, of course, uh, register callback to the button. So here, if I click off the button, on the button, yeah, I see, it's printed. And create a description. Okay, it's updated in live. You can still click on it, nothing is broken. So the main difference between uh, X widget and IPy widgets is the value semantics. I mean, when you, affect, when you assign uh, some variable in Python, there are no deep copy unless you code it in a special way. Here we have choose a more uh, traditional surface plus semantic which is value. So let's say I take a copy of the button. I display it. Okay, here I can change the color of the first button and uh, assign another color to the copy. So you see, Pro which proves that we have two different objects. Um, it goes further than that, so the copy is a deep copy, which means uh, the callback that we assigned earlier, here, has also been copied to the button, but it's another instance. So if I click here, I can see it's clicked, but this one is not updated, and the same in the other way. Uh, we also have, have uh, some uh, link widgets, which is quite fun, actually. Okay, so here I have two sliders. If I move one, get some fingering problem but to fix, but uh, globally works. And of course, if I reset the values of one sliders, the other one is updated too. Uh, we provide some uh, box widgets. So let's say we want to put a button in a slider in a vertical box. So you are for the compiler. <laughs> Just uh, okay, so I get my button here and get a slider here working. Uh, okay, so and then uh, we implement most of the widgets which are not controlled. So, um, numerical widgets, progress bar, for instance. We can, uh, as for the widget, we can uh, change property and it's uh, updated in real time. Uh, we got numerical input. So, uh, here I can change values. You can reset it uh, outside, it will be reflected here. And of course, if I ask for the value in the output, I get the correct answer. Uh, we get timer, we get Boolean widget, so it's a checkbox, toggle button, valid check, string widgets, text uh, area widget. Actually, this one is my favorite because um, this line is just like a big security hole. Password the display. <laughs> Password the display, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and we also have, uh, yeah, we also implement the widget layout. So here we just define button and we update uh, its layouts in real, in live. So that's it, I won't display uh, every widget because it will take uh, too much time. But uh, that's for the widget. And I will uh, yeah. let Sylvain uh, finish. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to give some credit. So, this is not just me and Johan. Uh, Loïc Guarin, who is a researcher at uh, Paris University, uh, has been working a lot with us on the clean bindings of Zeus. Uh, so, uh, he has a lot of, uh, he's put a lot of time into this. Uh, if you're looking for uh, resources in some of these projects, uh, here are the GitHub repositories for Xus, Xus Clean, the X property um, um, uh, project that re-implements the threadlets. We have uh, Extensor and all of the bindings of Extensor for Blast, Python, R, Julia. XSIMD is the SIMD acceleration project that uh, powers Extensor. 
we have an, a set of FFTW bindings that were uh, contributed by a third party contributor that is uh, doing a great job on this and X widgets, obviously. And we also have a documentation on Read the Docs and Read the Docs up for all of these. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you can. I mean, the first time you compile anything, it takes some time because it's uh, it's not really C++ was never really meant to be interpreted. So, <laughs> I think it's a really good tool for education, and the main purpose of the C++ widgets would be to create applications that don't run in the notebook but make use of the Jupyter front end and widgets for like really fast applications actually. So that would be a compiled application that you don't make modifications to, but would be used for deployment and would you know, make use of all the work that's been done in the, in the Jupyter front-end and widgets. Yes? So Xus is a library that implements the Jupyter protocol. So it's meant to create kernels in general. And we make Zeus Kling that uses Kling in, uh, as, as an interpreter and create a kernel for Kling. It's the kernel for Kling. And then XWidgets is the widgets library. Yeah. And then, then yeah. The test of NumPy? Um, so, Xsensor is not NumPy, so it's not coding into NumPy. It's, it has its own logic, and the internals are really different. Uh, although it happens that um, a, a, another contributor to the Xsensor project has been able to run uh, parts of the NumPy test suites uh, on Xsensor Linalge, uh, and it was passing. So, I think it's, uh, it shows that the, the behavior is pretty close. Yeah. Uh, not yet, but uh, there's support for it in uh, the option we are giving to the interpreter. So yeah, so something we can add quite easily. Yes. Yeah, you just reuse Kling. So um, Extensor doesn't have a memory model. It's an expression library. So it can adapt to any memory model. And you can add an NumPy array to a Julia array and multiply it with an R array. And you we would actually make adapters to the, all of these memory representations and operate upon them in place. Uh, so it's also a lazy uh, computing algebra. So when you do A plus B plus C, there is no temporary man, uh, created and all. So it's very, very similar to Eigen or Ublas in that regard. Yeah, in, in a way, they, they are creating a memory model for everyone to adopt while we are creating a syntax and an expression system that adjusts to any memory model. And actually, we are talking a lot to, to Wes and uh, Arrow contributors to make Arrow bindings. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, the performance yeah, so for certain operations, certain memory model may be better. So that's actually a degree of flexibility that we wouldn't have with something like NumPy, where you have a fixed memory model. So for example, we could have uh, expressions that are, for example, a concatenation of an in-memory container, another tensor that actually makes calls to a file system for, to get its data, and something that is computed on the fly. And then say, we concatenate all of that. And what's returned is an expression that's not evaluated only upon access or when you assign it to another container. 
So the, this is really creating a common syntax to, to make operation upon data independent from the source of the data. No, uh, but there is IPy kernel already, so um, which is written in Python. Uh, we could, we actually, they, we've been talking to some people who were interested in that because of uh, they were they were wondering whether it would um, allow to have multiple uh, Python interpreters running in process uh, for things such as binder, where you want to have many kernels running the same machine. And there seems to be limitations with uh, the way Python works, and that that, that that shouldn't be possible, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, we're reusing no. the one of IPy widget. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we're reusing the one of IPy widget. We just wrote the backends for C++. So only the declaration of attributes in the model, and also the observer pattern that we have to re-implement in C++. And since C++ is the common denominator between all of these languages, all they'll have to do is make bindings to X to X widgets rather than re-implement the backend. Yeah. So that that's a point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've done it here and in the demo uh, with extensor blast. We were dynamically loading the blast libraries upon importation of the blast headers. So the blast, the extensor blast header have clean pragmas that say load this library before before anything. Right. If, if, if ever you had trouble with Python and you find it too difficult, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, you can. <laughs> yeah, you can always write C. That works now. <laughs> I got a question. What's next in the pipeline? It's pretty amazing stuff. Do you have anything in the pipeline? Yeah, uh, so yeah a lot of things, actually. Yeah. <laughs> 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 We're just fighting on what to do first, but. Uh, now we got uh, ending, well, finishing the widgets, so supporting every widget, and then uh, moving on supporting BQplot, so backend for BQplot. Uh, and X volume. And X, uh, yeah, X volume for IPy volume, and, uh, <laughs> and things like that. And in the extensor world, uh, we are building a data frame, so for C++, which is sort of the big thing in the next few months. So we've been writing this this week. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're working on Xplot, which is very bare and not usable at all, but uh, we're starting to put some th some things in the figures and be able to display them. Uh, there is a lot uh, that needs to be done to for this to be complete. Uh, the main difficulty here is that uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, containers of uh, heterogeneous types, uh, which is not a natural thing in, in C++. Um, and um, also, we're not counting references or doing anything like this. So we need to really have a clear lifetimes and ownership of everything. Uh, and this is really where we are, we are what we're working on. Yeah, so and we also hit the limitation of Kling. So we're discovering because there's a lot of metaprogramming tools and really hitting yeah, the limits of Kling. So we have to yeah, report bugs and uh, improve Kling before we can finish it. I don't know about Ccache, uh, but so no. <laughs> yeah. I guess, um, yeah. <laughs> this, uh, we're going to be users of it very quickly for education purposes, uh, like 
teaching C++ without having to set up a compiler, an IDE, a linker, and you know, starting to write code right away. Uh, and which was one of the main reasons were why C++ was difficult to learn for beginners in programming. So, well, thank you very much. Uh,